Hey everybody, Rob Berthold here, continuing in the Revelation series. We're now in Revelation chapter 10, and as a little context, um, ultimately this is an interlude, right? So the timing is right around the 1840s, and during this uh, early 1800s, um, we just kind of finished up looking at how the um, uh, you know the Ottoman Empire was waning, right? Uh, spiritual revival, known as the Great Awakening, was taking place. Um, ultimately, um, also was atheism was becoming more mainspread. We also see how in Revelation 11, 7 through 10, how the stage was set for a final judgment um, of the seventh trumpet. So we are, uh, this is kind of an interlude right in there in, the, in between the sixth trumpet and the seventh trumpet. This period takes place again, 1840, really I think 1843 uh, to 1863, I think is really the, the time period uh, that I think most is taking place in. Uh, let's jump right into it. So um, we're looking in Revelation chapter 10, verses one and two. And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed in a cloud and a rainbow on his head and his face was as the sun and his feet are as pillars of fire. And he sat his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the earth. So um, this description of this mighty angel is, 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 is different than the last angel we saw, but it's still Jesus, right? This one is even more glorious uh, than we've seen. You know, they're, they're, it's now um, you know, transformed, even, not even transformed, but um, you know, showing even more um, sun and, and, and everything else. So we're seeing here the similarity. Ultimately, it's a description of Christ. Um, same description as in Revelation 1. 13 to 16, that um, shows that, um, you know, the angel must be Christ. So the same rainbow is seen around his head um, of the throne in Revelation 4, 3. Um, you know, he's glowing about his head, a token of his of his covenant of love, right? This is this rainbow glowing around his head, right? The cloud is also a token of deity, right? Clouds and glory covered him at, um, at Sinai. Think about Exodus 40. Um, there are also his chariot and Psalms 104.3. So uh, the spirit of prophecy also confirms this, that the mighty angel who was instructed by John, um, and who instructed John was Jesus, right, setting his right foot on the sea and his left foot upon the dry land. And this shows the part uh, which he is acting in the closing scenes of the great controversy of Satan, right? This position denotes his supreme power and authority over the earth. Right? There's another way to look at this is that this foot on the sea and land also signifies a wide extent and a proclamation of the message. This is the Great Awakening, right? Coming out of this um, oppression of Catholicism, now the message is coming back out again. The Protestant Reformation is really taking effect, right? So, um, again, to be clear, angels, Jesus, right? But what I want to focus at now is, in his hand is a little book which had been opened. If it was opened, it means it had been sealed. Right? So, again, we find here that um, the sealed book is from Daniel 12, 4. Let's read there. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even in the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Knowledge of the book, I believe, as well. Right? So, not, what is this book that they're speaking of? Well, we can fast forward into Daniel 8, and, it's, and this is the book that speaks of the 2300-day um, prophecy and the date of the beginning of of the judgment uh, starting with the dead in 1844. So this uh, knowledge of the book, right, this uh, and this book that is now opened is the, is the book from Daniel. Now this book, um, I have a whole course just on this. If you go to uh, the course on Bible prophecy, it covers this in detail. We're gonna get into it this one as well, but just letting you know, if you wanna really dive in, there's another course on that as well. So Daniel 8 speaks of that, that 2300 days, and that's what we're looking at. So that's the lens we're going to wear here. So next verses. And cried with a loud voice as when a lion roareth. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. Um, I think the thunders are echoes, right? I think it's he says something, says something, says something, right? And we've actually saw in the previous course about how the um, when the trumpets um, uh, you know, were sounded, those echoed several times. It wasn't just one, um, just, you know, judgment on Israel. There was multiple. It wasn't one judgment of Rome. It was multiple events. And so we see how, um, you know, there is a precedence of echoing uh, in Revelation. So I think these thunders are ultimately echoes of whatever Jesus had said. And when I read the seven thunders 
had uttered their voices, or when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, um, we read that John is about to write. And then he heard a voice from heaven, so it's something other than Jesus, another voice, uh, saying, seal up those words. So Jesus said something, John's about to write, and then is told, don't write it, right? Um, what you heard about these seven thunders uttered, so these, these echoes, uh, don't, wrote, don't write. Now, the seven thunders relate to future events which will be disclosed in their order. Uh, the unsealing of the little book was related to, uh, was the message in relation to time, right? Um, I think we are still looking, I, st I think there's still, well, I'll put it like this. I'm still studying the thunders because I think there's still something there that has not been uh, disclosed yet. So I think that's exciting. Um, you'll find out most of the book of Revelation is all in the past, right? But I think that's one piece that's, um, light has not been given on yet. So that's interesting. I'm excited about that. And we'll get maybe hopefully have um, more insight on that or more light on that soon. Um, so I do think that the seven thunders related to the future events. Okay. Now let's focus on the next couple um, verses. So Jesus lifts up his hand to heaven and swears by him who created the heaven, earth, and sea that there'll be time no longer. Now this is not, uh, this is ultimately, this is related to there not being any more prophetic time. Okay, so when we're thinking about what the context is, we're thinking about this is all related around that 2300-year prophecy. It's all from the book. So the statement by the angel in Revelation 10.6 that there would be no time no longer can be seen as a reference to the prophecy of Daniel. Right? By the way, when he refers, um, the way he refers to this, like it's very reminiscent of the fourth commandment, right? him that created this, the, the hand and the star. It's a little, little, uh, little nod there, I think. Ultimately, the mighty angel says, Time will be no longer. Now again, this means prophetic time will be no longer, right? Um, this time is not the end of the world's history, but the end of prophetic time. Um, so um, that should kind of put us in, in preface, but but ultimately want to get a sense on what's the the meaning of not there's no more prophetic time. And ultimately that essentially just means that all of these things, we, we just... You know, this one here relates to the 2300-year prophecy, um, which is now finalized. The one before it was the a day, a month, uh, a day, a week, a month, a, a year, right? Uh, that turned out to be that, um, what, 457, I think, in 15 days uh, period of the end of the Ottoman Empire. Before that, there was a 50, um, there was the uh, the 42-month, um, you know, the time times and half a times, that whole thing, the three and a half years, Um Right, all of those is saying it's just a nod saying, don't be looking for a prophetic time anymore in the Bible. Like if it has a date from now on, it's literal. Is the point of this? Okay. Next verses. In the days, right, of the voice of the seventh angel. So we know the seventh angel is always uh, in this instance. The seventh is the return of Jesus. So we know in the second, you know, at in the days of the second coming of Jesus. Okay. Uh, the mystery of God should be finished, right? As he has declared to his prophets, the servants. So what's the time period, right? Well, that's the second coming. Well, what's the mystery? Um, that's the plan of salvation. But let's, let's, let's go to the Bible and have the Bible show us this. So we read in Romans 16.25 that the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but is now made manifest. And then he speaks of the obedience of faith and the power to establish us according to the gospel, right? The power to overcome, right? So the revelation of the mystery, right? There we have the word revelation, we have the word mystery, right? And it says that this is um, establishing according to the gospel, okay? We read in Ephesians that God had create, chosen mankind before even creating the world and that we should demonstrate his character being holy without blame before Jesus, Right? And this is called the mystery of his will. Okay? He revealed the mysteries of the kingdom of God, um, um, you know, which is ultimately the unfolded truths of the way of salvation. So this whole thing is, is, is speaking to um, you know, uh, ultimately, you know, uh, Paul right, had been given a, you know, the um, understanding of this mystery, right? And the mystery, which had been kept secret from the world began, right? The mystery of God's will, which in other ages had been made manifest, uh, was not made manifest to anyone before this, 
right, was that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs, right, in the same body and partakers of the promise in, the, in, the, in Christ by the gospel, right? This is the fellowship of the mystery, um, which was from the, the, the beginning of the world, um, has been hid in God, this eternal purpose, which he purposed for Jesus Christ. So ultimately, the mystery is the plan of salvation. We read further that the, uh, we are stewards of the mysteries of God and are to sur- uh, sound the alarm and because people are in danger of falling into temptation. Okay? Uh, ultimately, the mystery of salvation. So in 1 Corinthians 2.4, we, uh, we must be in connection with the Holy Spirit to understand these things. So again, what we find out is that this whole mystery of salvation um, is something that needs to be spiritually discerned to understand this. Um, but ultimately, it's just the plan of salvation for man that God has tried to reveal and unlocked throughout time in the Bible, but now is just coming out um, you know, in a very clear way. And so we're going to learn about how this was, especially around the 2300-day prophecy, um, and how this was revealed. So again, quick recap. 1844, the judgment of the dead started, which was the opening of the sealed book of Daniel 8, which spoke about this 2300-day until the closing of this temple. Uh, Number two was a prophetic time would be no longer, means all time-based prophecy in the Bible were completed as of 1844. And number three, the seventh angel, or the return of Jesus, brings about ultimately the the fulfillment, the completion of the mystery of God's plan of salvation. Okay, so there we are. Now let's continue with verse 8. And the angel uh, said, uh, go and take the little book. Again, this little book was Daniel 8, right? Judgment of the Dead, 2300 Prophecy, Christ moving into the um, most holy place, okay? Which is open, meaning that it's now been revealed. It was it was hidden until now. Uh, out of the hand of the angel, right? Um, ultimately, and eat it up, right? Eating means to consume, right? And um, it will make your belly bitter, but will taste as sweet as honey. So what is this book? Again, the book is Daniel 8. Um, the nuance with uh, this whole bitter than honey, and this is pointed out by Stephen Bohr, which is that they're not in the right order, right? You would think it would be taste and then stomach, and this is reversed. So I think there's a little something interesting there. Okay, so let's look at this. Um, we read on how uh, in this, and I took the little book, and it was sweet to my mouth as honey, right? That's the 23 day prophecy, but then in my belly was bitter. So, um, this is speaking of the Millerite movement, who after William Miller was given to the understanding of the 2300 days, commencing in October 22nd, 1844. They initially thought 1843. They didn't knew that whole that whole minus one thing. Uh, with the, I mean, with that whole one, the date thing. They did. Uh, but anyways, plus one. The message was sweet as honey that Jesus was returning. So their message was they thought Jesus was returning on October 22nd, 1844. But then they suffered a great disappointment. Right when they realized that it was not Jesus' return, but Jesus' movement of moving from the holy to beginning work in the most holy place. So that's this concept of it was sweet in the mouth, wow, Jesus is returning, and then great disappointment, Jesus didn't come. We can read in Jeremiah 15, 16 that thy word unto me was joy, right? The honey is the joy of God's word, but then the bitterness was a disappointment experienced by the wrong application of God's word. Again, what we see is at the close of the 2300 days, the prophecy ending in 1844, Jesus moved from the holy place to the most holy place. And so at the um, ultimately, you know, when we see this, we understand then is that uh, you know, as Christ moves through the sanctuary, he had more work to do in the most holy place. And the same way that the earthly sanctuary had this, now, you know, the, the, um, um, you know, the day of atonement, the, the, you know, the one year, the one day out of the year uh, where Christ, go, where the, the high priest went in the most holy place, that's what's happening right now. Look, you can learn a lot more about this because I'm covering this very, very briefly. Check out the course, Plan of Salvation, Plan of Redemption, and it goes deep dive into the whole process and understanding the symbology of, um, you know, and the the, the, uh, relationship, the correlation between the earthly sanctuary um, and then what's happening in heaven. So the the thing we're going to point out about is that, that bitterness in the belly, and that was the great disappointment. So the Advent believers had expected the return of Christ, but he'd not come. They thought the last message of warning had been given, but it had not. They had a misconception of what the sanctuary uh, to be cleansed represented on earth, 
And when he did not return at the point in time, they had that bitter disappointment. Similar to what the disciples went through when Christ's death shattered their beliefs. Right? He, they thought he'd set up an early imp- earthly empire that we read in Luke 24, 13 to 27. And he was coming to save us from our sins, not save us from the uh, um, Roman um, affliction. So let's continue. And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. It's the same three angels' message, right? Um, but it can be repeated. So John was told to prophesy again. That means, um, you know, to prophesy again, he must have already prophesied. Now, the prophetic application of this was that those during the Millerite movement who did not lose their faith, right, the Advent believers who thought they were finished prophesying, um, were to prophesy again, right? They were uh, once again to you know, give the three angels' message, but this time it would come with a new understanding. Right? There must be a full, a further light after a bitter disappointment. So we understand this enlightenment was both the Sabbath message as well it was the message of righteousness by faith, and we'll get in that a little bit. And this is this is where we start into you know uh, the end ultimately of of chapter ten, right? So again, um, this uh, you know six trumpets. Um, you know, and, uh, you know, the sixth trumpet, I should say, was the second woe, right? The final warning. Let's see here. So as we're kind of seeing this, um, uh, sorry, chapter 10, I got, I got ahead of myself. As we're looking at chapter 10 here, right? It's all based on this 2300 day prophecy. That 2300 day prophecy started, uh, at 457 and moved until 1844. This, um, you know, this message, right, was given needing new context. So 1844, um, mystery was revealed, the plan of salvation. 1844, Rachel Preston shares the Sabbath truth. And then 1888 was the message of righteousness by faith. So that's a, it's a lot to pack in there, in a short little amount of time. There's a lot more still there. I think that this chapter 10 still has a lot more meat on the bones, so to speak, um, that we can consume, but really wanted to kind of give an overview of what the book has to say and understanding that this all relates around um, really understanding more in more depth and more detail the plan of salvation and the 2300 day prophecy. Um, so um, I was thinking of actually pulling a lot of slides into this one here, um, but I just figured I'm gonna leave it here. And now my recommendation is please go to the course um, to find out more about this, because it's a very short one. To find out more about this, go to the course on uh, plan of redemption. All right. Thank you guys so much for your time. I'm looking forward to diving with you guys uh, in chapter 11 uh, coming up next, where we really um, uh, you know, start looking at uh, the measuring and all of this other kind of fun things. So we'll get to that in a little bit.